Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Save Time, Win Contracts, Bidding on Opportunities with the Government. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Let's get started. My name is Danielle Hofer, and I am the Outreach Officer at Women's Enterprise Centre. I am physically located in Kelowna, which is on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Okanagan and Silk people. So if you haven't already, I invite you to put in which community you're from in the chat. And thank you to Netta, who's just posted a link, which will help you uh, find out which ancestral territory you are physically located on. So welcome everyone. Some information about our webinar today. You can communicate with us using the chat like you're already doing. And if you have a question that you want us to answer, please put that in the Q&A so we can keep track of that. As well, today, as you notice, we have American Sign Language interpretation and we have closed captioning provided today. To view the closed captioning on a separate screen, please follow the link posted in the chat. So thank you, Netta. That is the link that you'll be able to click on to see the live captioning. And if you're having a hard time accessing the closed captioning through this link, um, there's also a website um, that Netta can provide to you um, with a confirmation code. So please let us know if you have any challenges in accessing those services. And a big thank you uh, to our ASL interpreters today, as well as our closed captioning support team. So about Women's Enterprise Center, we are a not-for-profit organization dedicated and devoted to supporting BC women start, grow, and lead their own businesses. And we do this through a full range of services, including a business loan program where you can access up to $150,000 for your business startup or your business expansion. We also partner with other funders such as Community Futures, Futurepreneur Canada, and BDC. So if you're looking for financing, I invite you to connect with us. In addition, we have professional advice and resources. This is a free service that we offer. So if you're looking for business advice, I also uh, invite you to connect with us. Our skills training roster is really full and action packed, full of webinars just like this. Our sessions are recorded so you can always access them after the live sessions as well. Our mentoring programs are just as exciting. We have both one-to-one -one mentoring programs and peer mentoring groups where women can learn and be inspired from one another. And lastly, possibly most importantly, we offer a supportive community, sharing stories of women entrepreneurs and helping raise the bar and the understanding that women entrepreneurs are capable and have amazing business potential. For another few days, we have the Regional Relief and Recovery Fund, where you can access up to $60,000 in funding for your business if it's been negatively impacted by COVID and meet some other requirements. Our, um, this program closes at the end of the month, so if you're working on your application, make sure you get it in by the 30th. I also invite you to visit WEC.ca slash COVID-19 to access a full range of resources specific to businesses that have been impacted by the pandemic. So now on to today's session. The Government of Canada is one of the largest buyers of goods and services in Canada. The list of what they buy is long and it may surprise you, plus contact contract values range from hundreds of dollars to billions. So even if you have a small business, they may be looking to buy what you're selling. Have you ever been curious about bidding on federal contracts, but aren't sure where to start? 
Today, we'll dive deep into the bidding process so you can spend less time looking for opportunities and more time growing on your business. We are delighted to host Afnan Al Hashimi from the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises, also known as OSMI, who will share key information on how to build on opportunities. She is going to go into the details that will help you make the strongest bid possible. So make sure you get a pen and paper handy because Afnan is going to dive deep over this next hour and a half. And I wanna tell you a bit about Afnan. She joined OSMI as a junior analyst in January, 2020. She has a bachelor's of science in economics from the University of Victoria. And she's worked as a policy analyst within provincial ministries of health and agriculture in BC. Afnan constantly strives to improve the service delivery of the great programs and services OSMI provides, helping companies better understand the federal procurement system. So with that, it's my great privilege to hand it over to Afnan, who will lead you through this session. Thank you so much, Danielle, for that warm welcome. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, so let's get started. I'll share my screen. Sounds great. Okay, can you see that fine? Yeah, looks great. Okay, perfect. So yes, welcome to this webinar on bidding on opportunities with the Government of Canada. My name is Afnan El Hashimi, and uh, I'm with the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises in Pacific Region. So um, we're hoping that this webinar is going to be uh, really useful to businesses who are interested in um, selling their goods and services to the Government of Canada and um, provide you a high level overview on the bidding process. So methods of supply, how to prepare your bid, and to help you understand the evaluation and selection process. So uh, slide notes uh, will be provided through Women's Enterprise Center for your reference. And uh, they're a wonderful resource. So I, I highly recommend you, you do make use of those. And feel free to pop your questions in the chat. I will be answering questions uh, in the Q&A period at the end of the presentation. But uh, if I can get to it during, I'll, I'll definitely try. Um, and so as we're getting started here, um, I do, I would like to get a better idea of where you're all coming from. So please reply to me in a poll that's going to be, uh, uh, which, uh, that right there, that's awesome, thank you. Um, whether or not you've ever bid on a uh, federal uh, government of Canada tender, to, tender before. So let us know and just to get us a, give us a feel for, for the experience in the room. Okay, so um, so we have 16% who have and 84% who have not. Um, so yeah, this is this is awesome because whether you have or have not bid, um, I'm going to be providing some really good tips to help you get started and also um, maybe some things that you uh, are not aware of and might help you improve um, on your bids for the next time. So looking forward to that. So I'll just um, go to the next slide. So um, as Danielle mentioned, um, uh, this seminar has been developed and being presented today by the Office of Small and Medium Enterprises, or OSMI for short. And so we support small and medium enterprises, or SMEs, uh, through the federal procurement process. And we engage with businesses and help uh, them to sell their goods and services to the government of Canada, reduce procurement barriers in order to ensure uh, fairness in the procurement process. And so we interact regularly through suppliers uh, like yourself through one on one meetings, webinars and uh, uh, virtual uh, virtual uh, trade shows as well. And we listen to concerns, answer questions, um, clarify the procurement process and also help to identify opportunities.
So today's presentation um, will be covering uh, the, uh, the basics on how to bid uh, on a Government of Canada tender opportunity. And so um, this includes understanding uh, the different types of procurement that the Government of Canada uses, so the different procurement tools, um, the main elements of a solicitation document and how to respond to them, and also how bids are uh, evaluated and suppliers are selected. So there are many opportunities for small businesses, as, uh, as was pointed out, and the government does buy a lot of goods and services. So um, there are opportunities for, co for contracts, and uh, small businesses do have this opportunity to participate in, in this process. And so uh, the more you know about the federal procurement process, uh, the better you can position your business uh, to uh, sell to the federal government. So uh, the most important point um, I'd like to point out is that uh, in, in, this, uh, in this slide is that for any contract that is over $25,000, you'll see that contracting opportunity posted on the buy and sell website. For anything that's under $25,000, we're actually going to be looking to you to build relationships with the appropriate government buyers. And so those opportunities are not going to be posted publicly on the buy and sell website, because these are what we call uh, low dollar value contracts, where businesses would need to build networks and find opportunities uh, through those networks for these low dollar value contracts. Um, if the contract value is above $25,000, uh, then it is a procurement which must be listed publicly on the buy and sell website. And this is going to be the focus of today's presentation. So we're going to uh, walk you through the, the process of how to bid on such opportunities. Okay, so when you're looking at a tendering opportunity, you might see that there are certain international trade, agreement, trade agreements that are being mentioned. You don't need to be uh, thrown off by this. These trade agreements just mean, they do not mean that your good or service uh, must come from the countries that are mentioned in the trade agreement. Um, in, in these trade agreements are just referring to the thresholds of the contract. So when you see those trade agreements uh, listed, it means that the contract is going to be uh, above a certain number of dollars, which triggers the clauses in those trade agreements. So as a business, you can take the mentioned trade agreements actually as a clue for the size that the contract is going to be. So for example, you can see that the Canada Free Trade Agreement, CFTA, if that applies in a contract that you're looking at, then you'll know that our budget for that opportunity is probably going to be greater than roughly $105,000 for a services contract. So that could be useful in your planning. So uh, the process to find low dollar value contracts is what we call a non-competitive process. And as those contracts, uh, when, when, they're, when they're below $25,000, an approach to finding uh, these low dollar value contracts is to search uh, through the uh, government electronic directory service. So that we call that GEDS for short and uh, network with those contacts. And in my last presentation here at Women's Enterprise Center on March 25th, I actually went over an example of searching through the directory to finding the right contracts. And you could refer to that presentation for more information. Uh, but if instead uh, you're chasing a contract that is above that limit, then you're going to have to go through the, uh, the large kind of formal tendering process uh, through tenders that are posted on buyandsell.gc.ca. And so the four most common types of tools that we use in pro competitive procurement are the invitation to tender, a request for proposal, a request for standing offer, and a request for supply arrangement. 
And we will always say what method of procurement we're using and we'll always outline in details in the solicitation document. Okay, wonderful. So now let's take a look at each type of solicitation document that you could come across. So an invitation to tender or ITT for short, this will be used when we want to, what, what we, when we, when what we want to buy is straightforward or it can clearly be defined. So typically, this is going to be an off the shelf good or a construction project. So we know exactly what it is and we can spell out a bunch of criteria that are mandatory, yes or no questions, either you have it or you don't have it. And so we then proceed with an evaluation that is based on the lowest price bid that meets all of the mandatory requirements. So in this case, with an invitation to tender, the only thing that will set your bid apart will come down to price. But this is not the only uh, procurement tool that we use. So um, a request for proposal, um, these are uh, times when we want to uh, select a supplier based on something more than just the lowest price, such as we want the best value. So when we use a request for proposal, or it's also can be called a notice of proposed procurement, an NPP, um, these are for more complex contracts. And, um, and so what we want to see more of is an explanation that will give you a score what we call a technical merit score. So we're going to want to hear things about your methodology, how you want to solve the problem, um, risk mitigation strategies. So if you can identify all the risks that are at play within the project, and do you have strategies at play that you can mitigate those risks? So naturally, these things can't just be evaluated through a yes or no. Uh, there will be some scoring involved. And we produce a technical rating based on those criteria. And we combine your technical rating with your price in some way. And this will be explained, the way that it's combined will be explained in the tender notice. And the company that submits uh, the bid with the highest overall score um, is recommended to receive the contract. So it wouldn't be based on just the lowest price, but rather overall score. So just to recap, um, an invitation to tender is based on mandatory criteria and it's all about lowest price versus a request for proposal. It's based on a technical rating with mandatory criteria and point rated criteria. And this will give you an overall technical score that's combined with your price uh, and evaluated for best value. So uh, there's also some spe special circumstances where we buy a repetitive type of thing. And this is where we would use a standing offer. You may have heard of pro services and select. Um, these, are, these are examples of standing offers. And so we buy IT services uh, through pro services and other types of uh, business consultants. So pretty much anything that has the term consultant in the title, um, this can be thought, this can be bought through pro services and it's an excellent resource for small businesses. And because we have these requirements to purchase um, the same thing over and over again, it doesn't really make sense for us to run a procurement process for every single time we need one of those requirements. So instead, we use standing offers to create pre-qualified lists of suppliers. So you can think of a standing offer uh, like a catalog. It's something we would go to when we want to buy the same good or service, and we buy that, that thing uh, at predetermined prices and at predetermined terms and conditions. And so it's not a contract in itself. A contract is only created 
when you receive a call, when a call up is made from the standing offer. And that's when you would enter into the contract. And a supply arrangement is also used when we buy things on a repetitive basis. But here there are a bunch of variables in the statement of work that needs to be negotiated in terms of price, uh, in terms of conditions and skills required. So a supply arrangement can be thought of as a list of pre-qualified suppliers from which we select uh, some suppliers from to hold mini competitions. So the suppliers, uh, uh, these suppliers will be requested to submit a bid and compete against companies on the same supply arrangement. And we select the firm that has the most applicable experience and, and the right price. So IT services is a great example for the kind of technical services we pre-qualify companies for. And so there's a huge range of goods and services uh, where we have uh, these supply arrangements. And in many times, uh, there's only a short period of time open each year in order to get yourself qualified on these lists. So it's really important to know which procurement tool you're looking for. And this is my plug for OSME Pacific's one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, if, uh, it's, it's a government service and we help work with your company to find the right fitting procurement tool to help you focus your efforts on when you're trying to sell to the federal government. So uh, just a review of the differences and similarities between standing offers and supply arrangements. So just to recap, again, standing offers are like a catalog. Prices are determined, predetermined, and fixed, and we order out of that catalog. Supply arrangements are like a list, a mini, a list, mini list of companies. Uh, it, uh, it's a list of companies from which we can, you know, extract a, a smaller list of companies that we can hold mini competitions amongst them. So uh, what we'll do right now is go through the process for bidding. And I'm really going to try to take your perspective as an entrepreneur, um, saving you as much of your precious resource time as possible in order to get you as quickly as possible to the answer, is this opportunity right for me? Is this where I want to focus my attention? So the first step is to review the solicitation document. There is a ton of information on these. They are often 60 pages or even 300 pages long, depending on what it is that we're buying. And you as a small business owner with limited time and resources, um, or maybe it's just yourself in the company, reading through a 60 page tender that could easily take your whole day, if not the whole week. So how can we cut that time down? Um, so we wanna make sure that you're reviewing these documents in the most efficient way to determine if this is something that you want to bid on. And so before we go uh, through um, a whole overview of the entire tender document, um, I'm just gonna jump ahead. And so there's always these six parts, um, but I think that I always recommend that uh, you start with Annex A. And so Annex A, is the contract. This is, this is going to form the actual content of the signed contract between the government buyer and the eventual winning bidder. And this is a description of the work we're actually asking for with all of the requirements that, that you'll be asked to deliver on, all of the delivery constraints, everything. So start, start with this. It's really a shame that we put this at the end of the tender document. Uh, because really every supplier needs to start with reviewing Annex A. And if it isn't uh, work that your company wants to deliver on, then maybe this isn't the right tender for you right now. And you can go back to buyandsell.gc.ca and keep hunting for the right tender that you want to deliver on. And I'd like to just take another step further. 
Um, when you're going through the statement of work, I want you to feel excited. I want you to say, yes, this is exactly what my company does. And I could deliver on this better than anyone else. And that's a really good indication that you're right for this opportunity and uh, you, feel, you feel that. Um, and at the end of the day, you've got to make the decision that what is the best decision for your company because you want to be able to focus on where you can offer the most value. So just going back, um, so we're going to go back now and look at uh, what you'll find in each of these sections as well. So uh, once you read Annex A, uh, and you know that you could knock that statement of work out of the park, that's when you really want to go back through the rest of the document and make sure that you have a handle on the details. So part one will give you a general overview, usually just a couple of pages to be read. So for bidder's instructions, um, this should also be read early on. This is where you'll find details about things like uh, site visits, bidder's conferences, or if there's a need for samples to be sent. Um, site visits may be required, for example, when, for example, we need you to visit a mine that we're asking you to uh, clean, asking to be cleaned up. And so we'd like you to see the location um, in advance in order for you to be able to demonstrate, in order for you to be able to provide an accurate bid. Um, many times uh, these site visits and bidders conferences are mandatory. So if you don't attend, you would automatically lose your eligibility to bid on the tender. So uh, bid, uh, bid prep instructions. One common question that we get at OSME is if our tenders have templates. In general, no, they don't. There are some that do, uh, in, in fact, with the electronic procurement system, EPS, that we're moving towards gradually, um, that's much more of a template-based system. But for opportunities that are not on that system yet, uh, your best resource is uh, part three. This is where you're gonna find your bid preparation instructions. It'll tell you what we want to see in the bid and what sections we'd like you to include in the bid. And if you're submitting your bid by paper, each section needs to be provided as separate documents. And this is because there is actually different people who will be evaluating your technical bid versus your financial bid. And as soon, in fact, as soon as we receive uh, your bid, the financial bid goes away until your technical bid has been evaluated. And so, your this is because we don't want. Uh, it's for a very good reason. It's because we don't want our evaluation, we don't want your price to influence our evaluation of the technical merit of your bid. And so the best advice about how to organize your bid is exactly how it is laid out in the tender document. So we lay out what criteria we're going to be evaluating you on, and either these are mandatory criteria or point rated criteria. And the best technical bids just go in the exact same order and say, here is my response for mandatory criteria one, here is my response for mandatory criteria two, and here is the evidence that shows how exactly I meet these criteria in the same format that's requested in the tender document. So really when you do it this way, you make it easy for the evaluator to award you the most possible points and to mark yes that you meet the mandatory criteria. Wonderful. So part four is evaluation procedures. Um, this part will tell you the rules of the game and how the evaluation process will proceed and how the contract will be selected. So this part might tell you that we're going by lowest price only or we're going for best value. And this is how we're combining our uh, point rated criteria. Or it might 
might say that we want the best solution within our stipulated budget. So part five, certifications. Uh, there are some standard certifications uh, that will always uh, be uh, in this part. And these include things like employment equity, meaning that if you have more than 100 employees in your company, that you have an employment equity program in place. There is also a certification that you're not on the prohibited federal contractors list, which is just confirming uh, your, that your company has not been banned from doing business with the federal government for any reason, which is quite a rare occurrence. And this part also mentions uh, when these certifications are required. So uh, sometimes they're required at the time of your bid, and sometimes they may be required uh, to contract uh, uh, prior to a contract award. So if they're only required prior to a contract award, then that means you don't necessarily need to include that in your bid, and you would be asked for that at a later stage. And so uh, resulting contract clauses. So this is where you might see references to the standard acquisitions and conditions SAC manual, uh, which is available and also searchable on buyandsell.gc.ca. So um, also in my previous uh, time here at Women's Enterprise Center, I uh, gave a brief demo of how to search uh, that uh, uh, the SAC manual. But it's quite easy. It has a search feature and um, more than happy to, to guide you through that process uh, in a one on one if, if, if you'd like. And so all of that happens before Annex A, which we talked about. And so uh, there might be other annexes, such as security requirement checklist, for example. Annex B is often. Uh, uh, where we include the basis of payment, which requests details on your pricing. So that's actually where they would want your pricing to be laid out. And non-disclosure agreement is another possible exa uh, another example of a possible annex that could be included. So all of that was step one. And we're really asking you to review the tender document fully. But I wouldn't necessarily separate step one from step two. Really, the whole way, um, you're, as you're going through step one, you really need to be asking yourself whether or not you want to bid on this opportunity. So is your business capable? Is the statement of work something that your business has the capacity to offer. If we're asking for 30 million masks, is that the kind of size of order that your company can cater to? Are you going to be able to meet all of the evaluation criteria? If something says must in the contracting language, then it really means must. Because everything we do is fair, open, and transparent, and we really can't be fair if we accept a bid that does not meet the, man meet the mandatory criteria. Another question to ask yourself is, are the terms and conditions acceptable to you? So for instance, with our pricing structure, another condition is that we don't pay in advance. We pay 30 days after the receipt of an invoice of having, having received the good or service at the right location. Within the tender notice itself, there will be detailed instructions regarding invoicing such as who your invoice needs to go to and what the information the invoice must include. Once the invoice is received and goods or services are delivered, we have 30 days uh, to, make, to make payment. And you should also ask yourself, uh, do you need to partner with another supplier? Uh, we're open to joint business ventures and subcontracting. Uh, we just ask that it, you're transparent about it. So know your competition. You can search buyandsell.gc.ca to find information about your competition. This is a great strategy to find out 
what they are selling and who is buying from them. Also with any questions that you have, make sure that you're reaching out early and asking your questions uh, to the contracting officer that's uh, listed at the bottom left of the page of every tender notice opportunity. A lot of suppliers are afraid that if they ask questions, they might be bothering the contracting officer and that might somehow hurt their chances on the contracting process. But this is not the case at all. We want your questions. We want your expertise. Contracting officers want to see questions because it shows that there is interest in their tender and there is competition for it. So by all means, feel free to reach out and question requirements, suggest alternative methods for delivering the kinds of services they're looking for, and even just inquire what other opportunities are available. Because for instance, maybe your company is not big enough to deliver the full scope of what is being bought uh, on, the, on the current tender, but you might want to know what else that contracting officer has on their desk that could be very likely be related and more suited to your company. So it's pop quiz time. And I have a pop quiz for you all. I'd like you to answer uh, the multi this multiple choice question in this poll uh, here. Um, so the question is, um, what is, uh, what is the first thing you should do to help decide whether or not you should bid on a tendering opportunity with the government of Canada. So what is the very first thing you should do? So um, there's the poll. Wonderful. Okay, yes, most of you got it. It's awesome. So um, yes, read Annex A. Annex A contains the statement of work. It can, contains the full description of what is going to be requested of you uh, as, uh, as a successful bidder. And it's really important that that information is, uh, it, that, that's the information you, re you review first because that's what's going to give you an understanding of whether or not you could bid on, uh, uh, successfully bid on that opportunity and if it's a right fit for your company. Okay. This is awesome. So I'm glad that that's, if you could take away one thing, that that is the thing to take away from today. So that's great. So security requirements. Um, so the main thing you'll need to know uh, about security requirements is that you'd like to make sure that you're, re you're reaching out as soon as possible to the contracting officer to request a sponsorship for the security clearance process. If a security clearance is required, uh, you will need a sponsorship. Sponsorship is required before we can, uh, before we can conduct a security clearance review and we get the sponsorship for the correct level of security clearance based on the security requirements checklist for a particular tender opportunity. So the contracting security program, CSP, um, they're very helpful, but they're also very, uh, in, very busy. So if you have questions about the security clearance process, uh, uh, don't be afraid to reach out to them. Um, and so uh, the, contract, the contract security program, CSP, they, they, they would be able to answer your questions about the security clearance process, but they wouldn't be able to change the fact that you will need a sponsorship by a contracting officer 
on an open tender for a security clearance process. So step three, uh, collect information about your bid. So we talked a little bit about some of these things when we talked about each section of the bid. So uh, the contracting officer is the one who provides sponsorship for a security clearance. So if you're looking at a tender which has a security clearance requirement that you don't currently meet, then you need to reach out to the contracting officer as soon as possible and express your interest uh, in the tendering opportunity and explain that you don't currently uh, that you, you don't currently hold the security clearance and you want to request uh, uh, that you be sponsored for the appropriate security clearance. So the contracting authority uh, will initiate the process and uh, send you the forms that you need to fill. And the security process can take a while, up to four months, and it can easily be longer. So if a tender is open for only 40 days, then it's critical that you reach out as early as possible to get the security clearance. And so once you get a security clearance sponsorship, then that will no longer be a barrier for you to bid on contracts down the road because the security clearance will remain um, in effect for, for the given period of time uh, that's stated on, uh, on the document. So it's important for you to monitor uh, the solicitation uh, for amendments as well. Uh, you can subscribe to email notifications on a tender to make sure that you're staying up to date on all the amendments. So amendments are just answers to supplier questions. So for instance, uh, when you ask if a different, if you ask the contracting officer if a different delivery method uh, could be accepted, uh, for example, the contracting officer wouldn't be able to respond to you directly. And they have to be able they have to respond by publishing an intent an amendment to the entire ten, entire tender notice and this is because of transparency uh, we do this because we can't provide we want to make sure that we don't provide you with any information that we don't provide to all the other suppliers who are interested in the same tender so make sure you're watching out to see what answers to questions anybody else might be asking and uh, so you can get that information as soon as possible. So step four, prepare uh, your bid document. So we usually ask that uh, when you're preparing your bid, you'll notice that the title page of the tender has an empty space for you to enter in your information and sign the title page as indicated here. So this means that you're accepting our terms and conditions on behalf of your company and that the information contained is protected and true. And that if you accept this bid, this will become a contract. So uh, then you'll want to go back to section three, the bid preparation instructions and find out what sections you will be uh, being asked to provide. And they're most, they're most commonly the technical section, the financial section, and certifications. So an example of criteria uh, in your technical section could be your company has a chief financial officer with, with at least two years of experience and with more points if they have 10 years of experience. So in your technical section, you would want to say, my CFO has 13 years of experience with a reference of that in her resume, which is enclosed on page 15 of this bid. So it just, you really wanna lay it out clearly, criteria by criteria, and make it really easy for every, anyone who reviews the document to be able to easily follow along. And make sure you're answering each item in accordance with the evaluation criteria. It's also important to note that you cannot rely on any information that's included uh, that's in, not included in the bid document. So external links will not be viewed. We are prohibited from evaluating your bid on anything other than what you have included in the bid document. So make sure that everything is included there. And so these are just some tips on how to prepare uh, 
Oh, sorry. So these are just some tips on how to prepare the technical section. And these are things to, to just keep in mind. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight uh, is the fourth point of contingency plans. So I think that risk identification and risk mitigation is the way that you could really show off how well you know your business and the industry and the things that you can do to ensure that this contract is delivered successfully on budget, on time, and on scope. And you want to even go further that you're removing risks to the public, the government, and, your, and you as a business delivering it. When the bid is, uh, when the bid is based on a technical scoring grid, risk often shows up as a way that you could score a lot of points. And make sure, um, make sure that you're responding directly to what is being asked um, in the tender notice. Um, so if it is a bunch of mandatory criteria asking yes or no questions on whether or not you meet the criteria, a lengthy description does not need to be included. You just need to show that you meet the criteria and that will be enough. Uh, when you're responding to evaluation criteria, uh, also make sure that you're using simple language. If you're using jargon or acronyms or industry specific language, then make sure that you're explaining it or at least uh, spelling it out for the first time or whenever possible, just use plain language. Our, our contracting officers are experts in contracting, but as I mentioned, they're not experts, subject matter experts like yourself in, in your chosen field. And um, it won't be possible to go over all the best practices in this presentation, but you may refer to your pre the presentation notes that have been offered uh, alongside this presentation under the prepare your bid section. And that includes a lot of good tips of what to include in your bid. Finally, submitting your bid. So first of all, uh, you wanna make sure that you know when your bid is due. One of the most common things that gets amended is the closing date of a tender notice. So for instance, if we don't have enough bids or people are asking questions that are changing the criteria, we may need to make, make sure that we provide enough time uh, to, for industry to respond. And so all sorts of reasons could uh, delay the closing date of a bid. So that's all the more reason to be subscribed to notifications on the bid to make sure that you're up to date on all the amendments. Other things to note is that we do not accept late bids and there are no exceptions to that. Make sure that your proposal uh, follows the format that is requested and that you're using the same sections that we have uh, asked for in the same order. And also, as mentioned, uh, make sure that your financial information is included separately uh, from your technical bid. So if it's a physical document, separate documents. If it's an electronic uh, uh, document, then uh, separate files. So um, we are using ePost Connect system to allow for electronic bid submissions. Um, it's an encrypted service from Canada Post. And um, if this, uh, you need to remember to enroll uh, in ePost Connect early. Um, you do not need to enroll for a paid business account, uh, but you do need to enroll for a personal account to be registered uh, to your email address. And um, every bid will, uh, bid document will have instructions about who to email on the government side. Uh, to open what is to do what is called opening a conversation in ePost Connect. Um, so this is the process uh, that could take a few days as well. And so um, if you're interested in uh, bidding and you're going through the bid process through ePost Connect, as I mentioned, make sure that you follow the tender instructions and reach out early and request to open that conversation in ePost Connect. And that will enable you to submit your documents through a secure connection. So bid evaluation. Um, so you've been on buyandsell.gc.ca. You've found the opportunities that you want to bid on. 
you did all that hard effort to submit your bid. And now that your bid is in, what happens now? So um, how does our evaluation process actually work? So we'll go in some detail now. So our evaluation criteria is simple. We take a technical criteria as stated in the tender document, we evaluate it, and we combine it in price in some way, and combining it uh, in order to make a best value decision, because we're after the best value for taxpayer money. So with the technical criteria, uh, sorry, just one moment. My uh, laptop, uh, I, I need to plug it in. Sorry, one moment. I thought I did this before. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, we're plugged in. <laughs> okay, so... Um, with the technical criteria, um, there's going to be mandatory requirements. And these will be things like, for instance, you've been in business for one year, or you hold a Red Seal certificate for electric work, uh, or you're a certified change management practitioner. So these are mandatory requirements, which you either have or you don't have. And if your bid does not fulfill every single mandatory criteria, then it will not move forward in the evaluation. Uh, mandatory criteria can uh, only be changed if an amendment is made, but if the mandatory criteria remains unchanged, uh, we will not be able to accept your bid if it doesn't meet that criteria. For point rated criteria, in contrast, this doesn't have a straight yes or no uh, evaluation. There is a minimum number of points required to be considered as a responsive bid. Responsive just means that your bid meets the crit criteria and non-responsive means, means that it doesn't. So this is where we assign points based on your strategy, your experience, uh, what kind of facilities you can offer. Uh, there is a scale of points. So for example, points are allocated uh, if you demonstrate a complete understanding uh, for all the things that are required and present innovative ideas, that could be five points versus two points for moderate understanding and no innovative ideas. We will always be transparent with the, what the criteria are and uh, what the definitions on the point rated scale are. So how do we actually select uh, the successful bidder? So um, it will always be one of these strategies. Uh, and they're always listed on the very front uh, tender notice page, and they remain unchanged unless an amendment is published. So uh, lowest price responsive bid, this is usually used when with an off the shelf good, good that can be clearly defined. So here lowest price will bid, and there's usually only mandatory criteria here. For best overall value, here we're combining your point rated score with the mandatory criteria and your price in some sort of formula. Again, we are going to make it clear where do we weigh the most in points. So for instance, it could be 70% to price and 30% to quality or the other way around. This will be mentioned in the tender, do tender document. And another basis of se selection, which is least common, is the highest technical bid within a stipulated budget. So, by far, the most frequent reason for non-responsive uh, non bids is that suppliers submitted even though they knew that they didn't meet the mandatory requirements. There are some actually interesting government reports in Europe which estimated the amount of time and money that was wasted by government officials that had to evaluate bids that did not meet mandatory requirements, and it's in the billions. And of course, the flip side to that is also the amount of time wasted by small businesses who are preparing these bids when they know that they're not meeting mandatory requirements. So just restressing the point that if you are submitting a bid, you should know what score you will get and that you would achieve the minimum number of points and that you'll meet the mandatory criteria. 
It's also a really good practice to have another person review your bid with the criteria in mind before you submit, because it'll determine if your bid is easy to follow and also they can score you and, and determine what score you'll get. So how can you follow up? Typically, you won't hear back from us until, um, until we're willing to share the results. And you'll usually only get one of these three results. Um, either congratulations, we recommended you for a contract award, here are the steps, or you might hear that your bid is declared non-responsive because you may have not uh, met one of the mandatory requirements or have not provided one of the requested uh, information within the timeframe. Um, and uh, you may also hear that your bid was responsive, but not selected for a contract award, since another supplier may have submitted a bid which surpassed yours. In either of these three scenarios, you can request a debrief meeting with the contracting authority within 15 days of receiving the results of the procurement process. And the real aim of your debrief meeting is to help you improve your bid for next time. You typically won't be able to argue for more points. Really, the only argument that you could make is if the evaluator missed some key information which was, was in your bid. And so the best way you could prepare for the debrief meeting is to review the comments that were provided to you and review the information that was submitted in your bid and prepare some questions for the meeting. If after the meeting you feel that you're you're being treated unfairly because your bid was not evaluated properly, there are two offices that you that hear those complaints. There is the Office of Procurement Ombudsman, OPO, and there's also the Canadian International Trade Tribunal, SIT. And the office that you go to depends on whether international trade agreements applied on the tender. If they do, they go to SIT, and if it, they don't, they go to OPO. So OPO is typically for smaller sized contracts. There's also some specific uh, time limits about when to submit a complaint to either of those offices. And the clock starts ticking when you reasonably, reasonably know that you have grounds for a complaint. So if you have any uncertainty or questions about this, don't be afraid to reach out to that appropriate office. And of course, OSME can help guide you through those first steps too. The Office of the Procurement Ombudsman in particular has had some great success in providing mediation and alternative dispute resolution measures. So we do have a fraud tip line and I hope that you'll never have to use it. If you know there are people who are not playing fair in the procurement process, uh, collusion, contracts, issuing non-competitive contracts without justification, uh, then we want to hear from you. And so uh, please refer to the best practices section in your handout notes. There are some really good reminders you can post on your wall when you're creating your bid that will uh, re review all the important po po uh, points mentioned in this presentation. So, you know, for example, when formatting your bid, it's really a good idea to include the reference number, the date, and your contract information on the front, front page, um, your contact information on the front page. Um, there's also uh, no requirement for an executive summary, but it's a really great thing to do to make your company's proposal stand out. Uh, page numbers, table of contents, headers, those are all really great ideas. And since this proposal is going to be reviewed by multiple people, it's best practice to put your company name or company logo on every page of your bid. And as I said, it's also a really good idea to get a fresh pair of eyes to review your bid. So here are a couple of slides regarding uh, Yeah, wonderful, thank you. So here are a couple of slides uh, about our electronic procurement solution. Currently at the top of buyandsell.gc.ca webpage, you're gonna see a yellow banner that's inviting you to learn more about Canada Buys, which is a webpage that will be replacing Buy and Sell. Uh, the Electronic Procurement Solution, EPS, uh, will be using the SAP Ariba platform. 
And this is a platform that will be streamlining uh, bid, the bid process and making use of more templates for suppliers to complete. So this is the future. This is where procurement is moving towards. And I invite you to check out canadabuys.canada.ca webpage to find out more. Uh, during this transition, you may be able to bid on some tender opportunities through the SAP Ariba portal, which is the web-based tool uh, accessible from Canada Buys. And each procurement opportunity that you come across on the Buy and Sell website will clearly detail which platform you will need to use to submit your bid. So OSMI offers a number of other seminars that can help guide you through the procurement process. And I strongly recommend you view our events calendar on the buyandsell.gc.ca website to register for any other seminars that interest you. Uh, I'm also going to uh, pop my email uh, in the chat. Um, so uh, I'm, just gonna, I, I'm just gonna pop my email in the chat and I think I have it here. Okay, yeah, there you go. Um, so I, as I said, you're more than welcome uh, to, uh, our, our office is more than willing to sit down with your business specifically um, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting and hear your experience with the federal government tendering process and also wherever possible help you refine your strategy to sell goods or services to the government. So uh, feel free to connect uh, uh, with me directly uh, or I also will be providing um, the information of our OSME regional office. And we have, uh, uh, we have a policy where we try to reply within 24 hours of when uh, you submit your uh, inquiry. And just remember, um, we buy just about everything and we buy a lot of it. This process can be a little different than what you're used to dealing with with other businesses directly. So feel free to sit down with us and we're happy to chat. And so, as I mentioned, um, here is the contact information um, for our OSME Pacific Regional Office. And also, if you're if you're not um, if you're not uh, in, and if you're in a different province, I recommend you reach out to your regional office as uh, you can also find uh, each each uh, OSME office can also provide you with regional specific intelligence. So that's a very useful uh, feature that could be helpful to your business. So um, we have about uh, we have about uh, I would say uh, yeah just about just under 15 minutes left for any questions. Uh, I'm happy to answer them here. Um, and if I won't be able to get to it during this time, as I said, please feel free to connect with me or your OSBE regional office, and we'll aim to reply to you within 24 hours. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ethan. I think you did a great job um, getting into the details while still making it applicable to a business owner who's looking to take advantage of the bidding process. So let's get started with some questions. I have one here that's submitted through the Q&A. So with respect to templates, I was involved in an awful application for something like DFO, which didn't allow any uploads or graphics. With respect to efficiency, are there any standards for downloading and subsequently uploading data such as charts and graphs in a format that they might already exist in for example as a png or jpeg rather than re-entering text yeah that's a really specific question so i would say that um whenever uh whenever you're looking at uh upload procedures and, uh, and, and methods that, uh, that are being requested in the tender doc document, that's, that's the first place you'll need to review. But then um, what I'm hearing from your question is that um, there, is some, there is some barriers to the way that uh, you can efficiently upload the files and the documentation needed to support your bid. 
And so I would I would definitely defer to the contracting officer on on this. So I would recommend you do send your question uh, to the contracting officer as soon as possible in in the bid in the bidding process to say that I'm experiencing uh, this this challenge or or this barrier is are there alternative ways uh, to to meet this requirement because they would be the they would be the best person to be able to determine whether or not um, whether or not they would be able to accept it in a different format and they would provide that and once they get that feedback from you they would change that requirement for you and for everyone else on that tender so they would make an amendment and say that you could submit through this method. So I, I recommend definitely reaching out to the contracting officer with, with that question because they would be best uh, able to make the change in, in that tendering process for you. Okay, thank you for that question. And I invite any other questions to come in either through the Q&A or also through the chat. So uh, thank you so much. I do have a question. Afton, I'm wondering in your experience, what you've been most surprised by uh, of something the government has purchased before? Yeah, I mean, I, there, there's been, I, I, there's no, I don't have just one. There's so many, like whether it be ice cream or whether it be horses, um, we we buy them so it's it's always interesting and fascinating um that, that because you know the work that the federal government does ranges so many departments so many areas of uh, of canadian life and and it impacts our lives in so many different ways so the tools and resources that we need so whether it be a horse for the rcmp or whether it be ice cream within prison prison facilities like you 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 wouldn't imagine how variety what a variety there is in in that kind of um, in our purchasing and so that's why we always recommend small businesses to not be put off by the you know lengthy kind of process that does exist with contracting with the federal government um, we like your services your goods there's a very high chance that we buy it and so getting linked into the right procurement tool and the right um, you you uh, targeting the right approach is going to definitely position your business to be able to to uh, uh, be able to be a potential uh, supplier to the government and so yeah just uh, you, you'll always be surprised you if you can check on buy and sell the variety of things that we're buying and you can really be surprised. <laughs> mm. Yeah, ice cream. Okay, I like that example. Um, <laughs> I'm also curious about when, when businesses are looking at these opportunities, um, what's, what's something that you can say to encourage small business owners to even look at this as a growth strategy? Say for example, um, you know, you're a sole proprietor, you're a very small business and the prospect of working with the federal government is intimidating. What could you say to those clients? Yeah, I, I want to say OSME is here. So that's exactly what our office is meant to be, uh, is to support small businesses in this process. So um, if you feel overwhelmed, if you feel you, you need that guidance, that initial guidance to get started, um, we're here to help. We sit down with you uh, with a one-on-one -on -one meeting and we will uh, most definitely uh, answer your questions. So definitely reach out. Don't don't be shy. And um, it's think about it like this way. It's a win win scenario when the government of Canada can purchase um, goods and services from from Canadian small businesses because not only are we getting the best value, but we're also helping support our our own economy. And so um, we want to support that uh, that definitely and. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we meet with suppliers all the time to support them through understanding the procurement process. And so we also, as I mentioned, have uh, webinars that help guide you through uh, how to find opportunities, bidding on opportunities, the con uh, contract security phase, the whole, the whole uh, process, we, we're here to guide you. And so um, definitely check out our webinars, definitely reach out to us if you have questions, and we're, we're here to support you. 
I, I find that really encouraging. And I've always found Osme is a very um, uh, easy to work with team, uh, really great people. And so I think that's a great invitation for anyone listening is if you have any questions, reach out directly uh, to Afnan or anyone else on their team, and they'll make sure to uh, supply you with the information you need to um, move along the process. So I'm curious if anyone has any outstanding questions or Afnan, if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, um, I think that it's uh, it's definitely it's definitely a I, I know that it could be overwhelming and uh, and so I, I hope that the fact that there is no questions means that I did a good job, not not a bad job. So I really hope that uh, my presentation was clear. So yeah, definitely, if you have any questions, feel feel free to pop them in the in the Q and A. Um, but uh, I, I just want to say that um, this uh, this process it it, it is um, it is definitely. Uh, more involved than what you would typically see in in, in dealing with other businesses, uh, but I I, I want to say that it's very it's also very rewarding. You know you'll be able to um, connect with a very stable uh, client and um, and and be able to develop when you develop those relationships. Um, they are they are super useful. And so yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this presentation was mostly covering uh, contracts that are above twenty five thousand dollars. Um, I can speak more about the, the process uh, below $25,000. As I mentioned, these are low dollar value contracts. And um, if you Google uh, Government Electronic Directory Service or GEDS, GEDS, um, you're going to notice that you'll be able to uh, be able to search uh, through, uh, you're, you're going to be able to search by department. And one tip that I like to give is that as you're searching, uh, try all the different buttons try all the different options to see uh where your uh where your you can best target your approach for that low dollar value uh contract conversation initiation so um for instance um if if you want to submit if if you're based locally within british columbia and you want to specifically target offices that are located in bc i recommend that as you're going through the searching through geds directory you will notice that there are some regional offices and if you search for Pacific region you'll you'll be able to find that so. Um, as I mentioned, um, I provided an example of searching this in my last presentation on uh, here at women's enterprise Center, so I believe that's accessible to anyone who, who requests it and um, it's a very useful tool so uh, I would say that um, and, and also another tip is that if. If you're kind of lost in the government direct government directory, Osme is also able to help guide you through searching that directory. And in addition, if you've reached a certain office and you're not sure exactly which person within that office to, to talk to, I recommend you just start from uh, the director, start from the top, because if you send them an email um, and Obviously, you'd like to make sure that your email doesn't look like it's spam. Make sure that it's very personalized. Make sure that you can say, uh, you know, I, I, ha I saw this presentation with Osme. They recommended that, you know, make it really personal. Make it make it un understand them understand that this is you reaching out. And usually the director will know who to direct you to. So um, definitely, uh, definitely reach out and um, make those connections for low dollar value contracts as well, because there's a lot of opportunities there and a lot of uh, really great um, uh, uh, avenues to pursue for small businesses there as well. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And I have a follow up question from Sally here. So she's asking if a service is more consulting based, for example, communications or marketing, would it be best to apply within under $20,000 section? So that's a really good question. And your question actually um, raises uh, an, in an interesting subtlety, which a lot of people might not know. Um, if you're more in the business consulting marketing area, um, as I mentioned uh, in my presentation briefly, um, pro services is 
is a is the place that you need to be uh, is a definitely a place you could uh, focus your energy and efforts on because uh, pro services it's a, it's a national uh, master standing offer and um, it doesn't it it doesn't have a minimum threshold. So the nice thing about that is that um, basically the twenty-five thousand dollar threshold doesn't really apply. Um, what it what it means is that when it's an M NMSO, a National Master Standing Offer, there is no threshold. So it can even be hundreds of dollars, but it's posted through Pro Services. So um, as I mentioned, um, there's there's some subtleties. So if you need more information, feel free to connect with us directly in Osme, and we can uh, explain this uh, further. But for you for, to answer your question, um, I recommend any any person that has the kind of consultant or business consultant um, uh, uh, title in their in their job description, I definitely recommend you to check out Pro Services. It's uh, a definitely a really great website. A uh, great uh, 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 it's, it's a pre qualified list of suppliers which government always pulls from, and um, we we can help guide you through the process of uh, how to apply. Uh, to the pro services database. And so, um, yeah, feel free to reach out and more than happy to sh share that information with you. Excellent. And Afna and I did a quick Google search and I found, um, I believe I found the right link. So I'm going to pop that in the chat. If you can take a look and make sure that I'm providing the right resource. Um, and it was just the first one that came up. I, I searched uh, pro services procurement and that's the link and it's got a whole bunch of information is that the right resource uh yes yes it is okay. uh that's perfect and um yeah definitely look look at this page and um uh i i, I just realized i'm still sharing my screen so yeah i um yeah definitely take a look at this page it's uh it's going to help introduce you to pro services and as i said our our offices osme offices across canada are here to answer your questions about this procurement vehicle or any other procurement vehicle and to find out what's the best one that you should target uh, it, it, for your business fantastic okay so with that if there are no more questions we will wrap up for today i've got a couple slides to share with you from women's enterprise center but i did want to thank you afnan for your presentation for your energy and for your commitment to making sure that women entrepreneurs can have an equal shot at these really big business growth opportunities thank you it's my pleasure to be here and i'm I, I'm just so honored really to be a part of this process. I know women entrepreneurs uh, do phenomenal work and anything that we could do to support that is, is wonderful. So thank you so much. Excellent. Okay, so here I go. I will share my screen and give you a couple updates about Women's Enterprise Center before we wrap up for the day. Um, so you can see my slide all right. Excellent. Okay, so we've got a few exciting webinar series coming up that I want to let you know about. We've got three of them. So one is about exporting. This is exporting outside of British Columbia, not exporting to different countries. And lots of people don't realize that if you're exporting outside of BC, uh, there are different regulations and rules interprovincially and also globally. So we've got an amazing three panel person expert um, that is going to share with you how to do that. So I encourage you to register for that session. Oops. Uh, the next one is about financial fitness. So we're going to work your financial muscles through budgeting, through cash flow, and through understanding your income statements and balance sheets. This series may be the most valuable that we host because when you understand your business's finances, you can take control and you can make those leadership decisions that will help you reach your business goals. So really encourage you to take the time to understand your business's financials. 
And then lastly, we have the Human Resources Strategy Toolkit. So this is a webinar series about recruiting, retaining, and managing employees. And especially during COVID times, we've heard from entrepreneurs, it's especially challenging to attract and, and retain those amazing employees that help you reach your business goals. So that's a webinar series that we've created. So encourage you to visit WEC.ca slash learn and register for those. How did we do today? We want to know. Um, we've got a poll. Uh, is the poll live, Netta, or are we going to post a chat? Uh, let's see. We want to know how we did. Netta, are we going to go ahead? It's live. It's live. Okay, awesome. There we go. So how did we do? I'll give you a second to put that up. Okay, so we've got three questions here. Will you be able to apply what you learned in this webinar to your business? Overall, was this webinar a positive experience? And how does this webinar compare to other business training that you've attended? Okay, I'll give you five more seconds to fill that out. Okay, and I'll wrap up and close the poll in just a moment here. Thank you so much. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you so much for sticking to the end, staying with us. Thank you to Afnan again for your amazing presentation to our ASL interpreters. You kept up with us and did an amazing job. Also, thank you to the closed captioner support. So everyone has an opportunity to access this information. So that's a wrap. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day and we will be sending you the recording and follow-up resources um, shortly. So bye for now. Thanks everyone.